We discussed last week that it was going to be a bit risky given the weather situation, but the, the weather held out and they, the mission was successful. That's right, exactly. It went exactly according to plan, which is what you like when you're returning from a long stay in space and there's a potential hurricane nearby. But as you said, they had a perfect splashdown. The seas were very calm. Uh, and as you're seeing now, they had a very slow descent and kind of just gracefully touching the water uh, and were kind of, as we say, recovered or they were pulled out of their capsule uh, quite well. So it was a very successful end uh, to a very successful mission. And what does this mean for the SpaceX and NASA, NASA relationship itself? Is this another positive step in the right direction for both? Oh, it definitely is. Obviously, you know, they're going to be doing the, the official checking of everything and all that data. But, you know, given how everything looked based on both what astronauts said, their descent, you know, all of that sort of stuff, uh, you know, it's going to be a pretty much a pretty easy check of approval to say, yes, this capsule is ready to go. And NASA is already planning their first full mission uh, slated for October uh, and into the future. So definitely building on that confidence, that relationship that SpaceX and private companies, as we talked about, can pull off this really tricky, both safety and technical wise mission of sending humans into space. And given the success of this mission, what does that mean for SpaceX in terms of launching space tourists next year? Well, that's exactly right. This is one of their long-term goals, not just launching astronauts and NASA people, uh, but space tourists. They always said they wanted to do it kind of a, a few missions after this first test one, given this first test one's looking like it's flawless uh, and they have the next couple uh, ready to go. It looks like they will be, assuming everything stays on track, uh, launching tourists in 2021 towards the later half of the year. Uh, so, you know, all these things that we've been hearing about for five to 10 years are really now starting to be into play and starting to move forward, which is a really exciting time for, for space uh, venturism, space tourism, uh, space science, and all people who love looking up. Absolutely. It's a whole different era, really, in, in space itself. Uh, now, SpaceX's Starship prototype, which will be used for their new capsule to Mars, that's finally soared. Uh, now, we do have some vision of it. When I first saw it, Brad, I thought it, it might look like... It looks a bit like a... a here it is, a bit of a, a grain silo, almost. <laughs> uh, but it's not a grain silo. Can you take it through? Take us through it. Well, that's exactly right. It kind of looks like the very odd thing you would expect to be flying into space. Um, and it is kind of grain siloy, but this is kind of the, the body of the rocket. So they really just need to test the pressure. Now, a few of these tests before have ended in essentially explosion. Uh, so they haven't ended really well. And so even though it's kind of just hovering uh, only about 150 meters off the ground, that was really a first test to show the design, uh, the structure, the material all worked uh, without the previous ones, which unfortunately exploded. So obviously they'll put more work into making it look spacey rather than grain siloy. Uh, but it's a really big step on their next ambitious goals, and that is not just getting around space, but going to the moon and Mars, which this thing will take people. So what are the next steps then uh, for the Starship's development? Well, they need to do a few more of these tests. They need to be a few more of the designs. They need to get higher, because as you go higher into the atmosphere, pressure changes. So temperature changes and pressure changes. So they need to get through those environmental variables differently. They need to start making the structure more space-like and aerodynamic rather than just testing the material, and then eventually start sending it up and up and up until they start leaving the atmosphere. And once they can achieve that, then they're really to start aiming to do those tests to the moon, uh, and eventually once they get to the moon to Mars. So, you know, it's going to be a year or two, but as we see, these things happen so quickly that this simple test this year means in two years we may be seeing a way more spaceship looking thing flying into space. All baby steps, I guess. That's right. <laughs> now, Brad, the Hubble Space Telescope has used a lunar eclipse to measure the Earth's ozone. What does that mean? Take us through it. So this is kind of an interesting thing, right? Why would you use a big, powerful space telescope to measure the Earth's atmosphere? Well, in this case, they're trying to compare like for like. One of the big goals that we always ask is, when we find these other planets around other stars, are they habitable? Could they host life? What are their atmospheres like? You know, what is uh, what would they be uh, if they could support life? Now, the only place that we know of that supports life is Earth. So they wanted to actually see what would it be like to measure the ozone of another planet um, by looking at our own. So if we know what I, our planet, what we look like in space, could we go and find that same signature for other planets around other stars, potentially finding things that could host life? 
Now, there have been a, a number of reports, Brad, lately that there have been several planets that have been visible from Earth, very bright in the sky. It's quite unusual for us to see this, but how long will that last? Yeah, you know, we've been getting quite a few of these things that are great to see with our own eyes. Mars, in particular, Jupiter and Saturn in the early morning. If you're an early morning riser, maybe walking the dog or out for a jog, uh, Venus in the sky. We're going to see, we're going to keep most of these actually for the rest of this year. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn will be visible pretty much all the way through December, Mars into next year. Uh, Venus will be in the early evening, at least the later part of this year. And they're all really bright because it's all dependent on orbits. We're all on the same side of the sun. Imagine like cars going around a racetrack. We're all on the same side of the racetrack, which means we're all closer together and therefore they look brighter. So in this time of you know, being isolation and, and stuck at home and not being able to go anywhere, we can all go out and enjoy these. And I think the beautiful thing is when you go out and see these planets in the sky for the rest of the year, everyone all along the earth can see the exact same thing. So in this time of isolation, it is one thing that brings us together. I think that's really nice. Is there, is there a specific time or anyone can see it at any time? So, so the best time is in the early evening. So, you know, you don't have to stay out too late. So an hour or two after sunset, uh, you can see Jupiter and Saturn quite well. Uh, Mars rises about 11 p.m. Now, if you wait till November or December, uh, again, if a few hours after sun, uh, sunset, all of those will be visible. And if you do wake up early in the morning, uh, you'll see Venus to the east, uh, Jupiter and Saturn in the west, and Mars straight above you. So lots of chances, no matter if you're an early riser or a late hour. As you said, it brings people together. So I think that's very nice during this time, particularly during the pandemic, of course. Uh, Brad Tucker, thank you so much for joining me as always. Take care.